So welcome, welcome to Bonveau, to the barn, to our contemplative Eucharist on this feast of Corpus Christi. Yesterday evening I uh, zoomed in to a retreat of young people, young meditators in Brazil. And one of their themes in the retreat is spiritual intelligence. And uh, our coordinator uh, for young adult meditators actually is working on a, a program uh, for on spiritual intelligence for universities because thinking this would be maybe a, a, an easier way to get across what we would like to share. And I think the Feast of Corpus Christi really does ask us to use or to recover our spiritual intelligence, because the language is so challenging otherwise, the language of uh, Jesus saying, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, it is real food, and, uh, and you, you need to, you need to uh, taste this. This is very strange to modern ears. And it requires that spiritual intelligence to get into the, the deep symbolism of the, of the language so that we can understand the experience that is being opened up for us. In the first reading, the book of Exodus, we see Moses speaking to the people uh, about the commands of the Lord and all the rules and regulations of the of the law uh, that they were discovering and uh, he he's speaking to them in terms of a of a new concept really or a new insight into human relationship with god which is monogamous relationship settling into a lifelong fidelity to the experience of God, rather than just having one night stands with your favorite God uh, and to get what you want and so on. But to actually, uh, to actually enter into a lifelong relationship with the living true God. And this is the, this is the great event uh, that unfolded over a long time through the covenant with the with the uh, uh, with the people uh, that Moses was speaking to and which expanded in extraordinary ways in the new covenant of the new testament so corpus christi is a is a is a, is a sign of feast it was only invented really in the, i think the 14th century but the idea of the Eucharist itself, which is at the heart of this, is uh, the updated version of this covenant, or it's a sign of how this covenant has now moved into, into another phase, a deeper, more intimate, personal experience, not just the people, but each one of us individually and uniquely as part of this people. And that this experience uh, of the indwelling real presence of Christ, uh, which is of course what is, what is um, expressed in the Eucharist, produces the fruit of, of a new body of Christ in the world and in the people. So it's this deep mystical idea uh, expressed in the Gospel of Thomas, that the inner and the outer must become one. They must dance together into a union. In the Gospel of Thomas, in, uh, in the verse 22, uh, 22, Jesus is described looking at babies being suckled, feeding at the breast. And this inspires him to to say that 
the two must become one. And when you make the two into one, when the inner becomes as the outer, then you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So at the heart of this new covenant is this, is, is this mystical insight into the nature of reality in which opposites are united and the inner and the outer become one. Body and soul become one. Mind and spirit become one. And I think when we think of what this the symbol of, of the children, the babies, uh, feeding at the breast means, it isn't looking back to an earlier stage of consciousness where we are secure and safe and we, f we feel completely one in an unconscious way with the, with the, the, the breast and with the, with the mother's love. But it is now being described at a, at a more mature level of consciousness, the experience of union in which differences and uniqueness survive. They, they, can, they can exist within this oneness uh, as well. And that's the, that's the mystery, I think, as I see it, of, the, of Corpus Christi, really. It's a, it's a simple feast. Uh, if we had a, a nicer weather today, it's a bit cold here, uh, but normally in Corpus Christi there's a, there's a, a, a little procession outside leading into the church. It was a, in the old days, it was a very joyful. The kids were running around and throwing petals in the air, and it was fun. It was, it was religion as fun, which you don't see very much these days. But, um, but anyway, but it did express, it does express that <clears throat> simplicity, the deep simplicity of this union in which we are not opposing duality and non-duality. Sometimes in a lot of contemporary spirituality, that's what we hear. Duality in, it, it has to be destroyed and non-duality. But if it's really non-duality, then it allows duality to exist as well. Making not one, not two, the Indian tradition calls Advaita. So when Jesus at the Last Supper, as we, as we say retrospectively, instituted the Eucharist, what he was doing was creating a transformation of an ancient tradition, of an ancient ritual that defined the people and the family the family nature of the Jewish religion, in fact. Uh, the Passover meal is celebrated in people's homes, not in, not in the synagogue or the temple. And uh, it's the mother and the father and the children who take part in, in the Seder meal, uh, not a clergy. So that's how we have to try to recover the sense of, of the Eucharist at that moment in, on his last evening, at the Last Supper, uh, he is saying, I am with you, always, in many ways. This isn't the only way. Catholics sometimes think that the, the Mass or the Eucharist is, 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 the, is the only way in which Jesus is fully present. But there is a, there, there are innumerable, infinite, ways in which he is with us always until the end of time. Cut the wood and I am there. Lift the stone and I am there. Jesus says that in, also in the Gospel of Thomas. So the, the Feast of Corpus Christi that we celebrate uh, today refers to the Eucharist in particular as a particular free gift of being able to nourish our experience of his presence, 
but it is also the feast of the body of Christ as present in the cosmos, in creation as a whole. And that is the, the mystery of this simple feast. So let's be open to that gift that we come to celebrate as we, as Kevin will lead us with a song. to this Eucharist as members of a single human family, <clears throat> coming together for a meal, for a feast of wisdom and love, expressed in the simplest way. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit, which we just invoked, can create that simple mind in us so that we can enter into this time of worship. Jesus Christ, we recognize your presence within us and among us, and in the sacrament of your body and blood. May we offer to our Father in heaven, your Father and our Father, a pledge of undivided love. May we offer to all our brothers and sisters a life that we pour out in service of the Kingdom. And this we ask of you, as you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Joseph uh, will do the first reading for us. And the second reading today will be read in, with a commentary by Alan Chung 
from Hong Kong. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses went and told the people all the commands of the Lord and all the ordinances. In answer, all the people said with one voice, we will observe all the commands that the Lord has decreed. Moses put all the commands of the Lord into writing and early next morning, <clears throat> He built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 standing stones for the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he directed certain young Israelites to offer holocausts and to emulate bullocks to the Lord as communion sacrifices. Half of the blood Moses took up and put into basins. The other half he cast on the altar. And taking the book of the covenant, he read it to the listening people, and they said, we will observe all the Lord has decreed. We will obey. Then Moses took the blood and cast it towards the people. This, he said, is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you, containing all these rules. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you. The cup of salvation I will raise, I will call on the Lord's name. The cup, the cup of, of salvation, salvation I will raise, I will, raise, I will, I will call, call on the Lord's name. name. How can I repay the Lord for his goodness to me? The cup of salvation I will raise. I will call on the Lord's name. The cup of salvation I will raise. I will call on the Lord's name. O precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful. Your servant, Lord, your servant am I. You have loosened my bonds. The cup, the cup of salvation, salvation I will raise. I will, I will call, call on the Lord's name. A thanksgiving sacrifice I make. I will call on the Lord's name. My vows to the Lord I will fulfill before all his people. The cup, the cup of salvation, salvation I will raise. I will call on the Lord's name. <coughs> <clears throat> Alan, would you like to open the reading of the second? The second reading for us. Of course. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Hebrews. Now Christ, now Christ has come as the high priest of all the blessings which were to come. Which were to come. He has passed through the greater, the more perfect tent, which is better than the one made by man's hands, because it is not of this creation order, and he has entered the sanctuary once and for all, taking with him not the blood, not the blood of goats and bull calves, but his own blood, having won an internal redemption for us. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer are sprinkled on those who have incurred 
defilement, and they restore the holiness of their outward lives. How much more effectively the blood of Christ, who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice to God through the eternal spirit, can purify our inner self from dead actions so that we do our service to the living God. We bring a new covenant and as the mediator. Only so that people who were called to an internal inheritance may actually receive what was promised. His death took place to cancel the sins that infringed the earlier covenant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. <coughs> While I was um, reading uh, this letter, uh, something comes to me is that uh, we always heard about the uh, sacrifice from Jesus. So our sin is being um, forgiven. And um, I think people like us also struggle with our guilt feelings when dealing with God. Because we know God is um, a, some, a creature who could know all our flaws, all our sin, all our imperfections. But he also, uh, we, we also uh, become perfect when we are with, with him. And to be with him, I, I, will, I will say, is that we bring ourselves to here and now and during our meditation. And during, we always talk about uh, building the uh, faith, uh, meditation, Christian meditation is one of the way to build faith uh, with God, our faith especially. And um, what I have, I have experienced recently was the gift, as Father John Ming will also uh, talk about that, is the clarity from meditation. And uh, when I was meditating, uh, we <coughs> let, let down our daily problems to God or our thoughts, our feelings, even our, you know, feelings of being not perfect. Um, with, with, with time passed, uh, we start to realize that uh, our intentions, how our intentions are affecting our actions. Uh, one day when I was uh, confessing to God about my flaws, you know, about something I've uh, done wrong to somebody, uh, I begin to feel like oh, there's something's off with uh, this confession. Something's not right with this conversation uh, or this prayer with God. Uh, so I, I begin to dig uh, deeper and I figure out uh, what causes the difference is that my intention behind this prayer or this re repent. Uh, I was not actually asking for forgiveness and promise to change my directions in the future, but I was actually escaping from the pain of the guilt feeling, escaping from the, 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 the painful feelings of realizing I've done something wrong. I don't have the courage to make sure I, I never, I, I will be able to never do it again. So uh, I think that is one of the very interesting ph phenomena we're living with our daily life is that we know we are not perfect, but we are, uh, uh, how to say, we are becoming more closer to the perfection of God when we are with him. So uh, meditation was one of my uh, precious time uh, every day that I would be with God. And, uh, you know, so uh, more clarity and more faith can be built. Uh, the faith I would like to, to, to share today uh, is that um, I, I have like concluded in one sentence, so I won't take like too many times, too much time. Is that um, it's not to as we, we all know, we we we're all able to believe God is capable of doing anything. Uh, but there's another dimension of faith. I think we can develop through our meditations, and uh, and, and also related. Uh, to the sacrifice of God in this letter today is that 
uh, we also have to believe we are ultimately and unconditionally loved, no matter you know how 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 um, imperfect we think ourselves are, or how flawed we think ourselves are, or even we are being told by someone uh, in this world. So uh, I think this is one of the uh, dimension we can try to build during our meditation. I think med uh, the Christian meditation will help us to, to come into this realization that uh, not only I believe God can do anything, but I also believe he loves me no, no matter what. So uh, it's not about being judged or right or wrong. It's about how you're going to respond to this unconditional love from God. So I think it gives us power and it also gives us faith in our way, uh, in, our, in our path you know, uh, uh, of knowing Christ, uh, being with Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, very much. Uh, beautiful sharing in your own experience of faith and I think it spoke to all of us here. Can you do a little instrumental music? We'll just take a little quiet time uh, before we move to the gospel. Gospel according to Mark. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, his disciples said to Jesus, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and you will meet someone carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him and say to the owner of the house which he enters, The master says, Where is my dining room in which I can eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished with couches, all prepared. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them and prepared the Passover. And as they were eating, he took some bread, and when he had said the blessing, he broke it and gave it to them. Take it, he said, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had returned thanks, he gave it to them, and all drank from it, and he said to them, this is my blood, the blood of the covenant which is to be poured out for many. I tell you solemnly, I shall not drink any more wine until the day I drink the new wine in the kingdom of God. After psalms had been sung, they left for the Mount of Olives. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
What's interesting, I think, in this uh, passage of Mark is describing the Last Supper is, is the amount of detail the, um, about the, the place where they're going to cel- celebrate it and the preparations and how they had to get everything ready, just as we had to get things ready in the barn here for the Mass this morning and prepare the liturgy. And then also the reminder at the end of that passage that they sang the Psalms and then they processed uh, to the Mount of Olives to Gethsemane. So these are, why put those details in? This is a great mystical teaching here on the identification of Jesus with this ritual and is pouring himself into the bread and the wine. Uh, This ancient ritual now becoming uh, a new, a renewed expression of his presence to his disciples and to us throughout time. I think all the detail is just to remind us that this is very incarnate, very down to earth. And uh, he was also well, they wanted to be well prepared. And things need organization. They listened to him, they did what he what he asked them to do. And they were part of this, uh, this ancient and living tradition, which is very very difficult for for most modern people today to to understand that we that you can belong and be rooted in this tradition this living transmission which presents very contemporary problems of course but this is a feast of a tradition in which sacrifice was very important and on this day uh, the lamb of sacrifice was with many other animals was sacrificed in the temple but this has evolved the idea of sacrifice is, has evolved through this and it is part of a mystical tradition that takes us into the interior meaning of these outward signs, making some of those outward signs no longer necessary or desirable, but revealing the true meaning, revealed in a tangible, tasteable and physical way. When I was, before I went into the monastery, I was working in London and uh, I would travel up to the city of London, financial district, every day on the train, the rush hour, and uh, do my little bit, a bit for the economy. So, not because I was particularly interested in finance, but because I wanted to see what the other side of the world was like, rather than just studying literature. And uh, but as time passed, I began to reconnect uh, through meditation and through my, my journey to, to, a, a, to a spiritual dimension of life in a more immediate way. And I started to up to the church, go to communion, and then walk down to the station to get on the train. And it was 
in that uh, in that period of my life that I had discovered to my real surprise the sweetness of the Eucharist and the the experience of just pure happiness that uh, it was able to open in me and I had no explanation for it it was immediate it was surprising it was inexplicable but it was very real and physical uh, in a way well physical when you feel happy you feel happiness physically as well don't you so happiness the happiness of the eucharist uh, revealed itself to me in that in in the in those in that hour or so before i took the train up to the city of london and there isn't much happiness in the world today the we're planning a, a young people's retreat here later in the summer the theme of it is where has the joy gone For so many young people especially the joy of life has evaporated they're experiencing depression they're experiencing loneliness they're experiencing anxiety uncertainty and not only young people their parents and grandparents too but it's even sadder when it's young people because that's when there ought to be fewer problems in life and you can enjoy yourselves more so where has the joy gone where has the happiness gone we have a lifestyle which should make us happy because we can get what we like most of us make more and more of us can indulge ourselves and we can distract ourselves easily endlessly we can satisfy most of our lower desires except our deepest desire and the most innocent of our desires which is to be happy to be peaceful and this is i think what i had learned uh, at that period of my life uh, by going to mass early in the morning and receiving communion didn't know quite why I was doing it even I wasn't uh, that over religious but it was something I felt called to do wanted to do and it's in that uh, experience that I could say that the Eucharist is a gift of happiness to humanity and as Alan very beautifully pointed out uh, it is about this relationship with God, this covenant with God, which is based on unconditional love. Unconditional love. And it doesn't work if there are too many conditions attached to it. And that's unfortunately how Christians, as they lost this, in this mystical dimension of their faith, uh, came to misinterpret the Eucharist. They turned it into a commodity, something that was packaged and controlled and become, became too, too legalistic and exclusive. And uh, I remember speaking to a, a couple once on a retreat, a good Christian Catholic couple in fact, who had not taken communion for 20 years because the rules had told them, the church rules had told them that because one of them had been married before, I think she married at 18 and it lasted about, it didn't last very long. Uh, so she had re remarried outside the church and uh, was banned from receiving communion. And I, I knew about the existence of this rule, but I, I never felt how 
inhumane it was, how cruel it was until that moment. And instead of, instead of the law of God, the Eucharist became dominated and controlled by human laws and the human ego. And that's what happens when we lose the contemplative dimension of religion. Whenever a family gathers, which is probably much more rare today than in the past because of lifestyle, when they gather for a meal, the mother, the father, the family at, a, at, a, at meal time seems almost kind of iconic now when you describe that. But they meet regularly and they experience, and if, when you sit with a family that's eating together with guests in an ordinary way, you can, experience, you can see that there is something nourishing, not just through the food, but through their presence together, their being together, eating together, drinking together, talking together. And there's something very sweet in that and very healing, healing of whatever hurts or wounds might have been be present in the family. And that's not too idealistic because you'll see, I remember being recently with a, with a family, younger, younger uh, children, uh, loved it, loved being there and uh, close to their siblings and family and talking about what had happened. Uh, the, the older ones, the teenagers, uh, were very restless and they wanted to get back to their rooms and their, their wherever they did in their rooms, uh, get online uh, quickly. So I'm not over idealizing it, but I'm sure all of us can identify with that happiness that comes from sharing something as simple as real presence with each other. When we're present to each other and the family meal where everyone was on there looking at their messages or restless and distracted uh, wouldn't be quite so nourishing, of course. I am with you until the end of time, Jesus said. That's real presence, unconditional presence. And that is what nourishes us. That is what is sweet. And that is what opens up for us this experience of happiness. Even in the midst of the problems of life. And the Eucharist is, is an expression, not the only one, but a very special one for those who are tuned into it, and not everybody is, but a very, a very extraordinary expression in the simplest possible way, actually, of, of this real presence. But so is meditation. And for the great majority of people who don't tune into the Eucharist or haven't picked up the wavelength of it, uh, meditation is probably the most direct and simple way that they could find this peace and happiness and nourishment in themselves. And they will also find community because as we know, meditation brings people together. And the understanding of the Eucharist and, and of meditation are really very similar. It's the same dynamic of real presence, unconditional presence. You don't have to be in a state of grace to meditate. And uh, Alan again made that very clear. Meditation, like the Eucharist, 
burns away your guilt. It burns away your feeling of being inadequate or unworthy. If you do it, if you can accept it. So the mantra is rather like the bread and wine. It is an, an interior sacrament. And the sacrament is a living symbol that contains in itself what it signifies. So it's real. It is a symbol. You see it externally. But at the same time, to really see it, or to really be present to it, is to experience what it is saying, what it is symbolizing. That's the gift of all sacrament, it's the gift of meditation, and it's the gift of the Eucharist. It is what it is. Christelle will offer our intercessions and prayers now. We pray today for a greater, greater awareness of God's presence in our lives and in our hearts. We pray for a deeper faith and trust in the God who dwells with us. As we are reminded of the self-giving of Christ in the Eucharist, we pray that we too, as his disciples, will be willing to give ourselves, our time, our talents, our care, or our concern to all, so that his kingdom of love and peace will become a reality in our troubled world. As members of the body of Christ, we pray for those who suffer the pain of war and oppressions, for those families who grieve for loved ones, for refugees and prisoners, and for those who are marginalized. We pray for the strength and courage to reach out selflessly to those in need of our help. We pray for the members of the WCCM who will meet this week to plan the way forward, that they will be guided and blessed with the wisdom and joy of the Holy Spirit. We pray for all our deceased loved ones, friends and ablates, and for all those killed in wars and disasters. We pray for all who ask our prayers in today's chat and for those in our Bundle book for prayer. We pray in silence for our personal intentions. Father, we bring you these prayers for our world, for those we love, and for all who suffer, are broken, or grieve. Receive, receive them in the name of your Son, Jesus, our friend, our teacher, and our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Sisters and brothers, let us pray that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. Give the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands, praise and glory to God's name, for our good and good and church. Gracious and loving God, <coughs> we ask you to give to the world your gift of unity and peace. And we thank you for this sacrament, which is a sign of that unity and peace in the mystery that we offer. And this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's it right and just. just. It is right and just, our duty and our salvation that we should always and everywhere give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For the Last Supper with his Apostles, establishing for the ages to come the saving memorial of the cross, he offered himself to you as the unblemished lamb, the acceptable gift of perfect praise. Nourishing your faithful by this sacred mystery, you make them holy, so that the human race, bounded by one world, may be enlightened by one faith and united by one bond of love. And so we approach this table of this wond wondrous sacrament and bathed in the sweetness of your grace, we pass over into the kingdom that we, that we foreshadow here. Therefore, all creatures of heaven and earth, join us in a new song of adoration. And we, with all the powers of the universe, offer this praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, the God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> Lord, you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Let your Spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. 
for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In the same way, when supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sin may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Let us remember the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to be in your presence and serve you. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love together with Francis, our Pope, Pascal, our Bishop, and all those who serve your people. We pray for our brothers and sisters who have died in your mercy. Welcome them all into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse, the Blessed Apostles, Saint Benedict, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. us peace in our day. In your mercy keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for the kingdom, the, kingdom, the power, power and the glory of yours, yours now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sin, but on the faith of your church and grant us the peace and the unity of your kingdom, where you live for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Yeah. With your spirit. And this is the Lamb of God. The bread broken for us, and the wine poured out for us, so that we may share in the happiness of God. Happy are we who receive this gift. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul be shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen.
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, says the Lord. Let us pray. Let us give thanks for this time of worship, of peace, and the opportunity to, to, to find the happiness of God in our own hearts and to share in the divine life as we have entered into communion with the body and blood of Jesus, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's ask God's blessing on all of us and all those whom we will meet in the coming week and pray also for the members of our leadership teams who are arriving in Bonveau today to uh, begin a few days of discussion about the uh, organization and uh, uh, future priorities and so on of the community. Uh, we've done a lot of work in preparation for this and we ask your prayer and your, your blessing on, on these coming days. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Body.